welcome. Welcome to this panel titled Using Visual Media and Creative Approaches in Communicating Activism and Struggles for Social Change, The Case of Timor-Leste. I'm Vanessa Heerman from Charles Darwin University, CDU in Australia. I'd like to thank my colleague, Dr. Marisa ramos Gonçalves from the Centro Estudos Sociais in Universidade de Coimbra or Coimbra University in Portugal for co-organizing this panel with me on top of her many other responsibilities as part of this conference. I'd also like to thank the organizing committee of this conference in facing many logistical challenges thanks to the pandemic and yet for being able to bring us together virtually like this. We hope for a fruitful academic exchange over the next few days. This panel examines how visual media and the arts have been used as a means for representing histories of activism and struggles in and about Timor-Leste. But the visual is not only used to relate the past, but also to intervene in present day struggles for social change. The visual medium has been used to critique and contest inequitable power structures and to shape the new nation of Timor-Leste. Activism, its task of imagining an alternative future in particular, has been bound up with creative expression and practice throughout the world. Protesters have used uh, arts-derived forms of expression, ranging from visual formats such as photographs, posters and woven fabrics, to the performance of music and theatre to demand social and political change. The visual medium helped East Timorese exiles recall the homeland and represent it to others. Such work was important to help supporters of the East Timorese struggle for self-determination to imagine this contested territory and its people. Visual and performing arts were also vital in the task of cultural maintenance and to demonstrate the resilience of a people. The papers by Maria Madeira and David Webster are of particular relevance in recording these themes. Now in the independence era, East Timorese continue to express themselves and their desire for the kind of community they want using the means afforded by the arts, whether it is photography, drawing, painting, music, poetry or sculpture, there is ample evidence of the continuing importance of the visual medium. The paper by Vicente Maya describes the public outreach work of the CNC, the Centro Nacional Jega, some of which relies on the visual medium. The arts can provide a way to educate young people about their history in a fun and accessible way as well as to provide sharp critique about the society they see around them, taking shape from the ashes of war and conflict. In my paper, I discuss a feature length film, Emma Nudar Humano, People in the Manner of Being Humans, that was made by East Timorese and Australian artists and how it sets out to comment on the society and culture of Timor-Leste today and into the future. Also engaging with the medium of film, Luisa Neves Suarez discusses her film project, Morris May, which looks at healthcare services and support for women and newborns, including as a symbol of how the new nation is faring. We hope that we will have an interesting discussion in this panel involving researchers presenting from Australia, Portugal, Timor-Leste and Canada, and those of you attending this session, wherever you may be. We are mindful that we have not covered the whole spectrum of the arts in this panel. Music, street art, graffiti and literature, for example, are areas that we would dearly have loved to have included, perhaps in the future conference and future panel. The panel today is divided into two sections. Dr. Marisa Ramos Gonzalez will chair the first section and introduce our speakers. And uh, I will then uh, chair the rest of the panel. So um, thank you very much. I leave it there in terms of this panel introduction.
Today, I'm going to share with you about the creative approaches of Central Sega to intergenerational transmission memory and history in education in Timor Leste. Central Sega is a center that preserving the past history and memory of violence against Timorese and also preserve the old prison of political prisoners who against the Indonesian regime over 24 years that we call Antigo Comarca Valide, the place or the office of Centro Sega. Centro Sega also serves as the center of education to use these resources include Sega exhibition at Centro Sega, the old prison, historical site and survivors as an educational approach to public, particularly young generation of Timor Leste, to promote peace, non-violence, respect human rights, and to prevent repetition of violence in the future. Through a program which we call intergenerational transmission memory. So there are three main activities at Centro Sega. We call first transmission memory from parents to children, or to young generation. And the second is the Central Sega exhibition and also through to historical sites. And the third through media campaign. The first activity is transmission memory from parents to their children or to young generation. This is a teaching and learning process that enables students to listen directly from their parents about parents or relatives on history that face it during the struggle period. For this activity, Centro Sega introduced to number of high school in Dili since 2019. Centro Sega received from teachers about hundreds of history collected by students and about 50 students' histories being compiled in a book that call pupil history during the political conflict between 1975 to 1999. So this book was launched, officially launched, by the current Minister of Education, His Excellency Mr. Armindo Maya PSD, in 17th of July 2020, in commemoration of three years anniversary of Centro Sega. And the second activity is uh, Sega Tour. Sega Tour through Sega, Cent Sega Exhibition at Centro Sega, and also Sega Tour to Sega to historical sites. Centro Sega Exhibition is a teaching and learning approach that enables students able to access to information about Timor Leste history violence against human rights during the struggle period of Timor-Leste for its independence. And people able to access to related documents collected by Timor-Leste Commission of Reception through a Reconciliation, CVR. People to see the dark cells that preserve and other graffitis written by prisoners. The Sega exhibition is normally open for public, it's free, no charge. The exhibition is open during working days from Monday to Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Except for those who want to bring their colleagues, family, and friends, and even organization or institution to visit over the weekend, we are happy to facilitate by contact Centro Sega at least one week in advance. Tour to historical sites, there are numbers of historical places identified by Centro Sega in Delhi, and also numbers of historical sites identified Centro Sega in municipalities. In Delhi, over than 50 historical sites, places such as massacre, public demonstration, detention and torture, and also protection shelter of guerrillas or resistance leaders during the clandestine period. So this is also a teaching and learning approach that enables students to access directly to those historical sites. 
And in the meantime, people or students can listen directly from survivors' experience and their testimony about the place. And the third activity is media campaign. So media campaign through public publications such as Sega Report Self, brochures about the narratives of the historical places, narrative about national days, videos, sports about people's expressions, people's history, and also talk show. So those publications can be found in our Central Sega Library or in our website www.sega.tl and also can access to Central Sega Facebook page. So from this media campaign, there are the highest number of, of users are uh, media campaign through Facebook compared to website. So let me end my presentations by saying that these all are three main activities of Centro Sega as a process of intergenerational transmission memory in education. Hello. Thanks for joining me. I'm going to present my paper, which is titled In the Manner of Being Human, Gothic Aesthetics and Social Commentary in Experimental Filmmaking in Timor-Leste. And I'm Vanessa Heerman from the Charles Darwin University uh, in Australia. Before I keep going, I'd like to share with you uh, the trailer of the film that I'll be talking about today, Emma Nudarumanu.
So that is the trailer of the film that is available for viewing on YouTube. I'm now going to call up my PowerPoint before going on with my presentation. In 2017, an artistic collaboration between East Timorese and Australian filmmakers led to the release of the film Emma Nudar Umami, loosely translated as people in the manner of being humans. Set in Timor-Leste's capital city of Dili and its surrounds, Thomas Henning and Jonas Rusumalai Diaz co-write, co-direct and co-produce Emma Nudar Umami under the banner of Mal Kriyadi Cinema. Filmmaking in Timor-Leste is still in its infancy. Mal Kriyadi Cinema is a small film production house in Dili. It describes itself as a creative film collective from Timor-Leste that produces fiction films, music videos, creative documentaries, video projection and installation. The production company's name, Mal Kriyadi, means rude or ill-educated in Tetum. Two key creatives in this company are Thomas Henning and Jonas Rusumalai Diaz, who co-write, co-direct and co-produce Emmanuel Darumano, Malcriado's second film. Henning is an Australian film and theatre maker who has carried out several collaborations with East Timorese counterparts through theatrical productions such as the surreal Dokurai, Overturning the Earth, that toured several Australian cities, and films such as Mensagero, or Messenger, directed by Francisca Maya. Although Diaz himself did not pursue his creative practice at the well-known contemporary arts hub of Arte Mores, he had personal friendships with those artists from Los Palos, his home district at Arte Mores, such as the musician, Edson Camina, musical director on Emma Nudar Umano. Before becoming involved with Malcriado, Diaz wrote television sketches such as the series Dalan Realiza Mehi, Ways of Realizing Dreams, produced for job seekers and trainees by the State Secretariat for Education and Employment, SECFOPE, and funded, funded by the Asian Development Bank. In 2015, Malcriado Cinema produced a 17-minute vampire film, Hamro Baran, Thirsty for Blood, a cross-cultural collaboration between Australian filmmakers and East Timorese actors, musicians and technical crew. Hamro Baran is a critique of corrupt practices in government, with Apo Kintaung playing the role of a vampire. Henning and Diaz's feature film collaboration, Emmanuel Darumano, is also preoccupied with social critique, as well as the imagination of an alternative future. It was made with a budget of 7,000 Austra Australian dollars, with the script written and the film shot in five weeks. The film's four main characters are a husband and wife couple, a wedding singer, musician, the tocador, and a female ghost, the mate clamor. The film opens with a man in a black suit floating in the sea, played by Apo Kintao. He rises out of the water. He meets a woman dressed in white who is sitting by a fire. In tears, the woman, Lola Betty Pires, confides in him that she is already dead. She is a ghost or a mate clamor in Tetum, and she has lost her shadow. The man is confused about how he has ended up there beside her, listening to her story. The film sh soon shifts to other protagonists. The film soon shifts to other protagonists, here in particular the uh, bridal couple. This newly married couple, played by Tuta Monteiro Pires, 
and Juventus da Silva Correa. Their families, each from the east and the west of the country, have arranged their marriage since they were babies. At their wedding, they dance the wedding waltz mechanically like dolls, barely looking at one another. They are serenaded by long-haired wedding singer, Apo King Kong, on his acoustic guitar, who we, re who we recognize as the man floating in the sea at the opening of the film. After the wedding, the couple move into a basic cement house that has been constructed above another. Their house is bare and has few furniture. The setting is dilly and surrounds, where land tenure is tenuous after decades of conflict and displacement under Indonesian rule and construction is chaotic and unregulated. Their house, however, comes with its very own ghost, the woman in white who we saw at the opening of the film. The couple, like many other young people in Dili, cannot find work and barely have anything to eat. Husband goes out in search of work, but instead ends up getting kidnapped by an evil man when his skin inexplicably turned green, as you can see in this image. The man said he wanted to help with him, but instead kept him imprisoned in a pig pen, trying to teach the pigs to become smart from a few textbooks, as you saw in the trailer, where he is eating the textbooks with which he is expected to teach the pigs from. Husband eventually broke free and made his way home to find the musician had been invited into their house by his wife out of a sense of solidarity with a lonely figure. The musician is assisted in trying to work out his identity by a giant mirror in the couple's home. In East Timorese culture, the mirror is an item used as part of death ceremonies and rituals to enable family members to see the reflection of the spirit of the deceased. In the context of this film, according to Diaz, we should use the mirror to see ourselves first, to reflect on human values, on the fact that we are all equal, and that we are all just humans. The mirror renders musician visible to himself and symbolizes reflection and growing self-awareness. Related to the theme of identity is the question of gender and gender roles. While sharing a meal consisting of cakes that husband has collected from the rubbish bin, stale and full of cockroaches, wife confides in him. Every day I dream of escaping, telling him how much she disliked housework and how much she loved parties. Her dream, she tells him, is to invent robots to go to war and to help people plant corn an important source of food for the East Timorese. In turn, he discloses to her that he prefers to stay home and cook. They find that each of them is not happy with his or her accorded gender role or their gender role. Instead, gender fluidity and boundary crossing enable one to pursue one's dreams. And this is an important theme in the film. As if in a resolution of these contradictions, towards the end of the film, as the musician is killed by the evil man who kidnapped husband earlier and is then buried in a hilltop cemetery, the couple stands together by his grave, the grave of a friend they had only just begun to get to know. And here they are immediately after the musician was buried in his grave. A musician was sitting on top of his coffin as if pondering uh, what has now happened to him, how he has now ended up uh, being buried in this coffin. At that moment, when the couple stands by the, the grave of the musician, they finally disclose their names to one another for the first time. He tells her that his name is Amani, and she, her name, she tells him, is Ella. Disclosing their names shows them beginning to get to know themselves and to be human. 
a man who appears to be carrying the couple's baby in his belly. The baby is born and the film closes with images of Amanu and Ella holding their baby. Their faces morph into one another's, thus blurring their identities and as to who should be holding the baby. They both hold her and appear the happiest they have ever been in the film. Emma Nudarumanu is the first feature made in Timor-Leste that has explicitly employs Gothic aesthetics within the context of a post-independence art movement referred to as Movimento Cultura, one in which artists draw on East Timorese cultural references to intervene in the process of nation building. The rise of Movimento Cultura has coincided with a revival of East Timorese customary ritual practices, sometimes referred to simply as Cultura, and a valorization of indigenous origins, as shown, for example, by the reconstruction of the traditional sacred houses in the countryside. The arts such as dance, music, weaving, drawing, painting and sculpting as manifestations of culture have played an important role in East Timor's history. Contemporary art has provided a means for undertaking social critique, even from the late 1990s during Indonesian rule, when this took the form of asserting more visibly East Timor's separate cultural identity, such as by painting on the Timorese woven Thais fabric. Since independence, artists have intervened in debates on the construction of Timor-Leste as a new nation and to promote the importance of the arts in the process of nation building. Leonor Vega has argued that, quote, artists' attention has been directed towards fostering an inclusive national identity where all, where all spectrums of society are represented. She characterises the rise in independent Timor-Leste of what artists term movimento cultura as a phenomenon in which, quote, artists residing in the country's metropolis of Dili share a desire to forge a national identity through fragments of traditional arts, many times coupled with social commentary, unquote. Experimental filmmaking in Timor-Leste by those in Malkriadu cinema draws on traditions of oral storytelling, animism, and a belief in the spirit world that predated mass conversion to Catholicism in the 1980s and 90s. A surfacing of the supernatural, even in a globalised form, in a cross-cultural artistic collaboration is highly relevant to Timor-Leste's recent history of matters left unfinished and unresolved in its transition to independence, such as the legacy of Indonesian colonial violence and the rise of post-colonial discontent. Artists are making audiovisual works that incorporate spirits, ghosts and customary rituals to comment on present day crises and alienation. The 2006 crisis in Timor-Leste was also influential on Diaz who moved to Dili from Los Palos not long after the violence had subsided. The East Timorese experiences of violence and colonisation led him into highlighting in the film the importance of human values, valores e mania, such as mutual respect, empathy and appreciation towards others and linking these with the prevention of gender and racial discrimination and the recurrence of violence. Although East Timorese audiences have been and continue to be exposed to themes of horror, the supernatural and mystical elements that constitute uh, uh, large parts of Indonesian television, for example, the surreal storytelling style of Malkriadu cinema wrapped around deeper messages about social inclusiveness has not been as easily digested. Diaz blames the influence of Hollywood and Bollywood films in genres such as action, drama, comedy and romance and Indonesian Sinatron soap operas. The problem may be that audiences do not view death rituals, spirits and ghosts, which are such embedded parts of their everyday lives, as metaphors through which to channel contemporary critiques. Instead, they may be understanding Emma Nudarumanu more as a reflection of an animist worldview and a discussion of the appropriate ways of appeasing restless souls. In conclusion, Emma Nudarumanu 
can be seen as a manifestation of Movimento Cultura in Timor-Leste in the way that it draws on East Timorese cultural references that are then brought into play with global transnational concerns and themes such as gender and identity as an act of performing citizenship in this newly established country. By emphasizing the importance of self-reflection and overcoming alienation and estrangement from one another, the film sets out to warn that the colonial history of violence haunts the post-colonial present, not only in the built environment of Dili, but also something internalized within the people themselves. It is therefore an expression of trauma of the wounding of a city, a land and a people. It's also an expression of the struggle to overcome that trauma and a call for the East Timorese not to construct a system of oppression founded on violence that may lead to war and further suffering. Its East, Timor cultural, its East Timorese cultural reference points, however, mean that it could also be interpreted by local audiences in more diverse ways. So thank you very much. That um, concludes uh, my paper. And um, thank you very much for listening. And um, we will have further discussion later. I will ask Vicente if he's with us still. You can now contribute to the debate. And sorry for the huge interruption. We had the technical issues here. Um, I, I know that uh, it's a bit late in Dili, so we'll try to, to give the word to, to Vicente uh, earlier. So if you want to have questions, raise your hand physically or, or else use the chat function below. Uh, and then, because we are not many people, uh, you can also turn, on, turn off your microphone and, and do the questions to Vanessa and Vicente. And, and if you want to do to Louisa, she was not able to be present today, but I can uh, take note of questions to her. Uh, and we can also use the online uh, chat, uh, the forum online. You can post questions there uh, for the next two, three days. It will be open. And then um, the presenters can go there and reply. So we have that function too. So the floor is open for, for your questions to Vanessa and Vicente. I have a question for Vicente. Hi, hey, Mal. <laughs> Yes. I was interested in your comments about students doing family stories as history. Um, and uh, I think this is a really effective methodology for creating interest in history and, 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 and recording the history of the resistance and the occupation. Um, do you know whether is there news on the history program at UNTIL, which was proposed by Arminda Meyer? Um, if there's any news on this front, um, any news about that issue, and whether this sort of method pioneered by CNC could be used in the university context? I think you're muted, Vicente. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. Um, so so far we didn't hear from yet from from Mr. Arminu about what we are doing in relation to the uh, interregional transition memory that he, he just launched. It. Um, but yeah, we we continue to this program, and then we already extend to other uh, district to Ermira. And we just um, uh, train some students who are interested to, to write their parents' history. Um, and we expect that the government, particularly the uh, Minister of Education, uh, can use this approach. And I, I want to mention also one of the universities in Delhi, UMPAS, also, uh, the lecturer is very interested to use this approach. And the last year, he used this approach as assignment to the students. And about over than 200 students 
they interviewed their their parents, their neighbors, but only very few number that you receive, and then um, and we we also compile with other students from high schools in Delhi that we publish. So it seems that um, numbers of of university and high school are interested in this approach. Right. But from from the government itself, since we are working closely with the Minister of Education, we hope that this also will be included as a part of the teaching and learning process mm. in the curriculum. So this mm. is what our our expect. Yeah. Thank you, Mel. You're welcome. <laughs> So, um, if someone else wants to, to ask a question, please, uh, either to Vanessa or to Vicente, you can just turn off your microphone or sign off with your hand or in the chat that you want to talk. I think Maria, you need to turn on the the microphone on the left corner. Okay, can you hear me? Um, I'm. I apologize to everybody. Uh, Vanessa, you'll be sending my. Uh, I. I. There's so much problems getting in, so I didn't hear presentations, and I'm so sorry. I wish things had gone better for me. So. At the moment, I'm a bit quiet, just trying to bring everything in. So I apologize. <laughs> no problem, Maria. We had a lot of technical issues, so you come on time. <laughs> yeah. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, if someone else wants to, to ask questions uh, to Vanessa, if not, I will ask a question. Do you want to ask a question, Vanessa? I was just going to suggest that maybe um, if people are still thinking of questions, maybe we could go to our next speakers and then collect questions to the end. If, okay, if that want. could be. But you can ask your question before. Okay. Move. I was just thinking when I was seeing the, the presentation by Louisa, and she's not here to answer, but we can then talk with her. Um, that it struck me that you uh, were uh, you were showing uh, films done by Timuris, and she was showing her own film. So she's talking about her own uh, artwork. Uh, that the 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 way and the perspectives uh, of the uh, film director really shape uh, the the film, the contents of the film. So do you think there are differences in the in the way that you portray? Of course, there are differences in the way you portray. But do you think there are films made? Uh, to an audience that is East Timorese in the case of the film that you are uh, presenting about. And then there's a difference to the film that is a documentary done by Louisa, which is speaking to other audiences, if you understand. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Marisa. Um, I think that you hit on a, a particular point in terms of you know, the receptions of the audiences. So that's what's quite striking with the work that's done by Malkiadu Cinema is that it's actually, um, while worldwide, there is a trend to making Gothic films and using horror as a way of talking about uh, hauntings, uh, spectral hauntings, unfinished business, things of the past. That actually, um, doesn't, does, doesn't work as well, um, I think, perhaps in this context, that it's a, it's a very new, um, it's, it's a very, I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit of um, disturbance. Um, it's, a, it's a very new, I've got Anne Wigglesworth speaking, sorry. Um, uh, so it, it's a very new format for the East Timorese. And I wonder whether if it wasn't for, um, there's a, a, a very established uh, collaborative work that's being done by people like Chris Phillips, Thomas Henning, um, the artist at Arte Moris. And um, it's interesting that Jonas didn't um, do his art through Arte Moris, but that 
um, that's been very influential on him as well, that there is a certain uh, difference in approach in terms of um, using the horror uh, genre as a way of talking about things like corruption, which may not be as familiar to an audience that is not expecting that. So there's actually a lot of humour in the film, in, in the, both the films. So I would um, urge people to watch, particularly the Hamrok Baran. It's, um, it's quite humorous in the way it talks about um, uh, greedy politicians who want to suck the blood um, out of other people. And the vampire is, has come to a deal with the uh, public servant to, um, that he will supply blood to the vampire and the vampire will give him some magical uh, potions to be able to um, rip people off, to, to rob people, basically. So these are the social critiques that aren't really done in a conventional way. It's not done through documentary work. It's not done through human rights um, tropes, for example. If you look at the series La Loranda Justicia, you know, it's very, it's, it's very um, it, they're very realist films. They're very realist sort of documentary, uh, not documentaries, re um, realist style of filmmaking. So that in a, in a much more fantastical kind of um, approach that's used, that I guess the message isn't always um, that isn't always interpreted that way by the audiences. So there's a lot of humour to kind of reach in and engage um, the audience in that way, with this crazy vampire wandering around the cemeteries and talking to lovers at night. And it's it's a really fascinating work, and it's a way of reimagining Dilly um, a certain way as well. The sort of really darker um, side of Dilly to comment on things like homelessness. Um, the kinds of crazy construction that happens, the mining of sand, the incessant mining of sand in the Comoro River, that Dili is not a fit place for people to live in and to become human. So it's also, I guess, trying to intervene in a, in a transnational language about development, um, equality, human rights, but using a very different, um, different way. And I think it will take some time for the audience to become um, used to that approach and to think that it's got some social message in it. So as for, I, th I think you're right, that a directorial approach has a very, you know, um, that filmmakers really shape the narrative. And I think that it's very different to Louise's in the sense that it's a, it's a documentary about health services, but also thinking about where the nation is at. So in a way, they sort of have very similar themes, but coming at it from, from very different um, perspectives and with different filmmakers and a different eye being used to uh, trained on some of uh, similar problems of concern and trying to intervene in those conversations. Thanks very much. <laughs> Maria wants to talk. Yeah, I just want to say so, um, Vanessa, you think that so when you're talking about the audience, you're talking about an East Timorese audience, or are you talking about? worldwide audience, well, the target audience. Are you talking about East Timorese people? So the film was shown for a brief period at the Cineplex um, in Timor Plaza. And right. uh, it was premiered there. And it's also um, it was shown to the community at which it was shot, which was in Tasitolu. Um, and they had all kinds of difficulties with um, technology um, showing it there. Um, the screen nearly blew away and they had another one that was um, hosted by the, um, the sport and youth ministry um, at, outdoors at their office there. So, you know, it, it wasn't on for very long at Timor Plaza because they found that with a film like this, there weren't many um, audiences coming along and paying $5 to go and see this film. And so it was a little bit of a hard sell to the Timorese community about why they should be making this film so that's why it's 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 more an experimental experimental and festival um film and it's interesting how it's been received in different spaces so it's uh it's had showing at the melbourne international film festival it's been shown in a gallery in kuala lumpur with thomas henning um speaking there um so it, it's had that that issue of um you know, it, it, it had Timorese coming to the to the MIF, to the Melbourne International Film Festival and speaking there as well. But always, I think the participation is not as optimal for the Timorese uh, to be able to speak 
um, at an equal level because of the um, lack of interpreting that was done. It wasn't done sort of professionally on time, making sure everyone had equal access. So there's always a, a, an issue about cross-cultural collaboration of who gets to speak and who gets to address the audiences and, and how they frame those kinds of issues. So I found that when I spoke to Thomas Henning, when I spoke to Jonas, I had very different kind of insights into the process. Um, and it was very useful to speak to Jonas because he, he gave me a completely different sort of perspective on the film about how it was really trying to intervene in present day debates in Timor-Leste and how he saw his role as a young person um, within that. But as always the way uh, audiences will interpret things in very diverse diverse ways. So the audience is mixed, uh, Maria. Obviously they want as many people to see it as possible. Um, okay, because I've, as a visual artist, I'm also very interested in performance arts and video. And, and when I did a lot of research in Timor with, with, David, with David, David Palazon, we did the Totoli Bakultura and we went around and, and I noticed with the, please, Senor Vicente Maya, forgive me if I'm wrong, but my perception was that with East Timorese, even though the history of our lives, uh, the, the history of East Timor was so bloody and so horrible, but somehow the Timorese have got this sense of humor that can come out of, you know, when I give, when I give talks, I talk, my work is, it's, it's about, of course, you know, all the horrible things, but I always put a, a bit of humor in it and it seems to capture the audience a bit more. And I used to, always t tell David, we should do The Gods Must Be Crazy, a la Timor side, because that movie will just hit the Timorese and will become number one in the country, because it's, it's a kind of language that the Timorese can relate to. And sometimes I think with even myself, I'm at fault, the work becomes too abstract. As the Timorese have got some, I find that the, the, the sense of understanding and of accepting without feeling so much pain is humor. And I kept coming back to the ghost must be crazy. Everywhere I went, that same image was in my head. No matter who I spoke to, the youngest, the oldest, the wisest, the dumbest, was one point, the ghost must be crazy. And, and I, I just found this one way that humor, that's it. So, um, and I myself am at fault. I don't put humor in my work at <laughs> all, in a humor way. But my work is very, very serious. But it, there's a missing link somewhere along the line that I think the Timor is still the perception of movie, of cinema, of watching a screen is still, I find sometimes um, it detaches from the way we feel. So we just stay, you know? So it's, it's a bit less abstract. Would be a good start. <laughs> That's what I think, <laughs> as an East Timorese visual artist. <laughs> and I think the film's quite humorous, and I think that that's why it kind of doesn't cross cross culturally sometimes. For you know, an Australian audience, they kind of think, "Why are you laughing at that?" Or if you look at Hamro Paran, there's very very funny scenes in that. But again, it's 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 an issue of of humour and how you you use humour. And I agree with you. Um, I, I think about the Dilly Filmworks collection of short films. One of those is called Mane Badiou, The Vagabond. And in that, it's about a man who runs a, a dog meat restaurant. And immediately at that point, you know, having international audiences, they kind of think, oh, dog meat restaurant. And, but, you know, and then it, it does um, touch off on Timorese's senses of humour as well. So, so it does appeal to them. And then there's lots of, of funny scenes in that. And so, as you say, it is difficult to, to do that cross-culturally, I think. Yeah, I th uh, thank you for that, <laughs> for, um, for reflecting on, the, on these issues. I think uh, I agree that I also like very much his Timorese humour. And I think he brings that <laughs> ability, uh, protection from, you know, the violence that's, that's uh, haunted humor is. So uh, I do agree that, uh, and humor is, is, is different across cultures, we know that. Um, and uh, as my 
is uh, in the mood to speak. Uh, if someone else has questions, we can still debate a bit more. Um, if not, we'll go to Maria's presentation. But I'll wait for, for a few more questions. And if you don't do the questions now, we can do it all at the end, if you prefer. Uh, okay, so my presentation. Am I speaking for how many minutes? You have uh, 15 minutes. It's, uh, okay. It's okay. And I'm just speaking to you guys like this. Yes. Is this it? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Now, can I start? Okay. All right. Well, um, Maria. Okay. I'm speaking as an East Timorese woman and as a visual artist that has crossed boundaries because when you talk about visual art in Timor, it's such a new issue. You know, the, 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 although the art has been there for centuries, you know, when we look at the rock art in Ilikere, in, uh, in um, Los Palos. But my main concern, when, when I started, when I went to Timor and did my first um, exhibition, I was so shocked because the first thing, the, the main um, response from the audience was, Mas, be, artista feto, artista ne feto. And I was really stunned because I never thought myself as, an, as, an, as, a, as a female visual artist, I just thought myself as an artist. And then I started noticing, well, it does make sense that they ask that question because every artist in team, East Timor is male according to what they, they think that the, the East Timorese artists are male. But that's not, not true at all. We, they are male when we're looking at the last 20 years, 30 years. And I noticed that when I did my research, everything was very female-ish. Every essence of what we did in our visual arts had female imprint, fingerprint in it. So, I thought it hard and I decided to do my PhD on bringing awareness to the issue of the female impact, the women, the contribution of East Timorese women in the contemporary art of East Timor. And I had a lot to do with Arte Moorish. I was really sad because most, 98% of the time I was the only female in the room. That's one thing, the first thing. The second thing was that when we spoke about fine arts in Timor, everyone thought about Da Vinci, Salvador Dali, which makes sense. I can understand why they say that. Da Vinci, Salvador Dali, and Michelangelo. So I thought, okay, we've got the missing link already. And when we spoke about female artists, they said there was none that women can paint. <laughs> and I was looking at them, of course, at the time, I didn't really talk a lot about my work because I was there as a teacher. And then I start questioning them. And I, I noticed that everything that we do with our fine arts, as much as I'm also at fault, we just can't get away from all the arts and crafts, all the performance arts that are organized and produced by women in East Timor. Timor is uh, artist, though all the art Timorish use all the symbols, colors, see, um, geometry, everything that they do with the art has to do with either the taish or the ceramics or the basketry, performance, performance arts, and even the theoretical side of the arts, they keep going to the women. They keep going to the women all the images were produced by women in these arts and crafts. And I kept asking them, but that's very female-ish. And they said, oh, but that's not, no, 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 because that's their duty. They don't see it as a female creating art or creating crafts. They see it as, is a duty. They have to do that. But I kept telling them, but that's creativity. And it took me a while to try and convince them that whatever they were doing had female imprint all over it. Even their imagery of the women, I found it amazing because they took the women, they had lots of 
portraits of young, beautiful females. And I've, you know, I kept saying, why, why are you doing that woman dressed in Timorese costume? They say, oh, because though our women are forgetting our culture, they are beautiful like this. And as I saw, they are carrying the culture. Are you telling me they're carrying the culture? Oh, no, no, we're saying that they should be like this all the time. And I kept, you know, and I've tried to, to create an awareness that no matter what we do about this team or in terms of art and culture, we have to recognize the female fingerprints in it. And um, when I went with David, David Palazon, we did this um, uh, research for Tatoliba Culture and also I did the research for my thesis. We not I noticed that everything, even with the woman Lulik, with all the events that were happening, of course, the men would be the ones gathering the materials for the woman Lulik, gathering, you know, going get the animals. But that it would seems to be like uh, in the in the periphery because once it comes inside the woman Lulik, the women take over um, all the presentation of the food, all the the uh, maintenance of the, the, the art and crafts and the, the, um, the performances to, to welcome guests, everything was done by women. And I met with a lot of Leonines, which obviously are male. I noticed that, so I'll be sitting and they'll be like in a circle around me. I'll talk to them and I'll notice that behind them the women will be sitting. And every time the Leonine will be speaking, the women would whisper in his ear and go, and they go, oh, and I forgot. And the Leonan would continue talking. And then the woman will talk and they go, oh, and I forgot. And it just went on and on. And I thought, we are quietly speaking. We've got such an influence in East Timor's art, art, visual arts, contemporary arts, arts and crafts, but is not seen as a creative entity, uh, is not seen as we are artists. It's just our duty. And the idea of having a female visual artist in the concept of the patriarchal society of East Timor is still so minimal that I, that's one of the main reasons why I had to do my PhD because it was the only way I could be heard. You know, I could do great paintings, I could do a great exhibition, but no one would hear me. But then someone says, oh, but she's doing a PhD and everyone goes, oh, oh, okay. And someone asked me, why are you doing, you know, why are you doing a PhD? And I just said, to be heard. I'm a woman, I have to be heard. <laughs> and to do it, I had to get higher education, postgrad to do it. And with visual arts, it just pains my heart. I think the best visual artists in East Timor are women. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. Gabriela Karaskalam, Seed. Albertina Viegas. Donna um, Veronica Pereira Maya myself included, I think we are the forerunners in the visual arts, contemporary arts of Timor-Leste, but then there's not once, not mounted ever, any member of the government, any institution ever approached us females to do something. It was always, oh, Artemorish, oh, Gamble, oh, Afalika, which is great. It's not that they can't, but I think if you are really talking about looking at the contemporary, contemporary arts and the forerunners, you can't underestimate the women who are working so powerfully. Um, and everything that we do as female artists, it's all done on our own accord. If I don't approach someone and say, can you please give me a chance for an exhibition? I'll never get it. I still don't get it. You know, I mean, I was so proud of having this virtual exhibition because you have access to a lot more people normal people. So when I had the chance, I just, I grabbed with both hands. And I think that the, the women are a bit more critical because I think the men are a bit more physical. If they're angry, they're a bit more physical as the women are more vocal. So I see this vocal, that's this female vocal thing in the, in the fine arts. And I think it's something that it needs to be, we need to create awareness about that. Um, you know, the thesis, I'm really proud of the thesis and it talks, it goes of course into much more detail and even compares the work, Ohara, please, mom is doing, Philip, Philip, please, I'm doing a conference. Um, and um, 
Oh, sorry, my son got my, my thought process away. But, you know, it, it, when I did my first exhibition in Timor, which was the first solo exhibition in the history of the country, I was shocked, you know, in 2005, the first exhibition, solo exhibition in the country, history of the country. Um, I was um, sidelined already. Okay, okay, she's a woman. That was the first thing. And then I was the first to do a, a, an exhibition, a solo exhibition in Indonesia. I was the first to do the teaching degree. I was the first to do a postgrad. And it's just such a lonely, lonely road because I find that the women of East Timor have so much talent and they've got so much influence on the arts and, and, and the, the, the arts and crafts, the, the, the performance arts, contemporary arts, but no one talks about it. And it breaks my heart that after my first exhibition in Timor, a Kirsty Guzman opened the exhibition. And two months later, a Lola Foundation did a fundraising, oh no, did a conference about women and the arts of Timor. And someone wrote to me after the conference apologizing that they've never, never knew me. And if they, if they had known, uh, they would have invited me. And it really broke my heart because their president opened my exhibition <laughs> in Timor. You know, and, but there's still, they still this sense of denial. Oh, but I haven't heard, oh, but, and I just, uh, we're just creating waves. And, and I find that the culture is just trying to ride the boat on top of it without feeling the wave. And um, a lot of the artists in Arte Moorish, what they do is just got so much female influence. And when I tell them, they look at me really, stung because they are not aware of it either and it, it's um it's an issue that should come to the fore and i think future exhibitions they should consider timorese timorese female artists i'm not talking because of me can be somebody else please i find i find that the work of timor female are more abstract are more outspoken and for some reason seems to be more courageous that's my perception. And, um, and I will keep going. I will, still, you know, I mean, 2022, it's gonna be 20 years of East Timor's independence. I hope someone thinks, okay, where are the women? Can we do an exhibition about the women? <laughs> you know, because I'm sure it's gonna be Afalika, Arte Morish, Gamble, no one will approach, Gabriela Kraskalam, Maria Madeira, Albertina Viegas, uh, you know, and, Myself, Albertine Viegas, um, Gabriela, we all did our degree. We've got a fine arts degree. But no one talks about it. You know, the, I think Tony Amaral has got a fine arts degree. Inu Bere, who's studying now in Brazil. They're all male artists. But um, apart from Tony Amaral, I don't know anyone who's graduated from fine arts. And um, in this issue of, oh, but fine arts, you know, it's not part of our culture. You know, it's too, it's too forward. You know, and I think you want to go night clubbing. You want to reach out to the Western society with all other, other aspects of, of our society and you don't do it through visual arts because they think that to be an artist, it has to be traditional. Oh, they, she doesn't know how to dance Timorese Timuris Tebe. She doesn't know how to do Bidu Tebe. She doesn't know how to speak Tetum. She doesn't know. Well, teach me the contemporary way and then I'll reach out to my traditional way. That's how I went back. I did contemporary arts and then I thought, but if this happens in Australia and in Portugal, I wonder what happens in Timor. So I went back to my roots through my contemporary um, work. And this is what I'm trying to tell a lot of the younger generation. You don't have to be traditional, be contemporary. And then you start looking at the traditional because every artist or everyone who deals with creativity, it gets to a point where they question their own identity. That's where I go. And I hope that we'll keep going. And I really, really believe in the female influence of East Timorese arts and crafts, of East Timorese um, culture. Um, and I will do my utmost to keep creating that awareness. That's all I have to say for now. <laughs> 15 minutes, yes? Even, even more if you want. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. But, but um, it's just on, yeah, if you want to add anything, you still have some time. Five oh, minutes. no, no. I think, uh, uh, I think it will be, I think it will be very, I can't wait. I'm 
can't wait to, to publish my thesis. Well, Marie's just frozen. Oh, yeah. Oh, the, the technical problems haunting us as we go. The Australian <laughs> National Broadband Network. <laughs> but it's good that she was able to do a presentation. Thank you, Michael, for <laughs> helping out in a truly international solidarity <laughs> movement. Um, yeah. We'll no, wait for her to come back, but also I, I didn't present her properly because we were so informal that we, <clears throat> that I can do that now. He is back. He is back. Is she back? Okay, so. You need to unmute your audio. I'm, I'm going to, to hand over to you if you need to say a few more words, Maria. No, I just say, don't forget our big of a course that are attached to our Mother Earth, our dear Mother Earth, in a law. That's all. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thank you for listening. <laughs> okay. Thank you I'm so finished? much, Maria. Thank you, Marisa. I read already work and I love it. <laughs> so it's good. <laughs> I, I, I forgot because we were so informal to present your biography. I'm sorry, but I will do it now. Uh, so Maria Madeira was born in the village of Gleno in the Hermeta region of Timor-Leste. Uh, a, a visual artist, she has carried out over 30 solo or group exhibitions of her paintings, sculptures, drawings, mixed media collages, and installation pieces across Australia, Portugal, Brazil, Macau, Indonesia, and Timor-Leste. Between uh, 1996 and 2000, she worked in Western Australia as a high school teacher, art teacher, visual artist, and cultural advisor for several arts and cultural institutions and organizations. Between the years 2000 and 2004, she returned to Timor-Leste to live and to play her part in Timor Leste's recovery, rebuilding, and development of the world's newest nation. She recently completed her PhD uh, in art studies uh, from Curtin University, Australia. So I'm very sorry I, I didn't do this before, uh, but uh, make sure everyone know about your trajectory. Um, is David with us? Uh, I think we will move on to David's presentation. David Webster. Is so should I David? Yes. So probably introduction. Yeah. So um, our next, our final speaker is uh, David Webster. He's a history professor at Bishop's University in Canada and adjunct research professor at Carleton University. His latest book, which is, I think, being launched in this conference, is titled Challenge the Strong Wind, Canada and East Timor, 1975 to 99. And he's also on the International Advisory Council of the CNC, of Centre National Chega. And his paper this evening, my time, is, an, is uh, titled Visual Imagery in the Canadian Solidarity Movement for Timor-Leste. And it's very early in the morning for David in Canada. So thank you so much for joining us at this time for you. Unmute, David. Okay, that's the standard conference thing, forget to unmute. Um, okay, well, thank you for the chance to be here. And uh, because we're uh, um, probably a little bit behind on the time, I should go straight to the share screen and uh, skip, the, uh, skip the rest. So, all right, have I successfully shared screen? Okay. So, uh, the case that I'm making uh, today is that uh, even in unexpected places like the uh, Solidarity Movement in 1975 to 99, visual images can be uh, very powerful. And human rights groups uh, use them regularly, generally speaking, for um, one of two purposes, either to uh, raise awareness of suffering and shock people into action, 
or to promote a visual narrative of triumph and the power of action. And these images have often proved highly effective, and I think this is a case study of where it has proved highly effective. So today I'm discussing, as I said, the use of uh, visual imagery as a mobilizing focus by the Canadian Solidarity Movement for East Timor and using three cases to do that. Uh, the first being the way that photographs uh, taken in 1974 by photographer Elaine Briere were used in Solidarity Movement actions as a key document of um, what she called harmonious Timorese life disrupted by Indonesian invasion and genocide. The second examines the use of uh, Timorese textiles, which are, seem very apolitical since they're a piece of cloth, um, but in fact uh, can be very political because they're used here to boost sympathy for Timorese cultures uh, within Canada. And the third case study attempts to uh, read the visual imagery of a solidarity movement protest as a visual expression of solidarity with Timorese resistance imagery. And basically I'm arguing that the Canadian solidarity movement used images to paint a picture of East Timor in the minds of the Canadian public, where East Timor was almost entirely unknown um, until the 1990s. And these images of a noble so-called tribal people unjustly invaded, who nevertheless provided an example of resistance for the world. Um, and while it didn't reach all Canadians, this effort built sympathy among many and proved in the end more powerful than the narrative promoted by the Indonesian government, uh, which was accepted by and large, uh, at least in the early years, by the Canadian government. And uh, since I've already heard the plug for the book, I will, I will just sim simply say that uh, uh, this draws from material in my most recent book. So, start in 1974, when a young Canadian woman took the so-called hippie trail that so many other young people had taken through Southeast Asia, um, Elaine Breer took some remarkable black and white photographs of local people. And gradually, uh, Briere's images began to appear in photo exhibits by small East Timor solidarity groups located around the world. Um, until 1989, as everyone knows, of course, uh, Timor-Leste, East Timor, was a closed military territory. The Indonesian government is using silencing as a weapon. Uh, consequently, in a pre-internet time, um, no technical glitches, no internet on which to have technical glitches uh, in the 1980s, um, by and large. So very little information is reaching the outside world. And Briere's photographs start to change that in the late 1980s. Though they're silent images, they still have voice. To move on to this. Uh, Briere's photos enter the world of solidarity movement campaigning in 1985 with the launch of Amnesty International's campaign marking 10 years since the Indonesian invasion. And this one photo that I have higher in multiple uses, um, photo of a young woman carrying corn on her head, is, um, becomes an iconic image in the solidarity movement, um, appearing in uh, multiple solidarity movement publications um, as illustrated here. They become in effect a campaign tool for Canadian solidarity activists. And indeed other solidarity activists. These are, I grabbed two random examples uh, from uh, the Swedish East Timor support group uh, to put up here. So that's, that's Swedish for those who don't recognize the language uh, in the middle images. Um, so Briere's photographs are documenting a, uh, a way of life disrupted by forced, uh, forced invasion, forced resettlement by human rights violations. And her writing stresses the same themes. So quickly to quote an example of that, uh, Briere writes of arriving in East Timor in 1974 with a friend, um, visiting uh, a village house reserved for women being adopted by local women. And she writes later that Timorese lives in her view represented, uh, quote, subsistence affluence interwoven with a rich social and cultural tradition. And in this rather romantic view, pre-invasion East Timor is close to paradise which makes the hell of Indonesian rule all the starker. Um, so these photographs heavily used. Move to the next case. So the theme of cultural survival of indigenous peoples is dominating the early Canadian solidarity movement campaigns. And this exhibit at the Canadian Textile Museum as it now is in Toronto, 
illustrates this intersection of material culture and activism to me fairly well. So the museum arranges a show of Timorese Tice weavings in 1990, time that uh, this is not widespread globally. Um, activists in Canada and Toronto negotiated with the museum to include a display on the history and human rights situation of Timor-Leste with the textile exhibit. And that penetrates the curators. So um, a note from the curator of this exhibit, Barbara Hewitt, reflects how political themes wove their way into the display. So a quick quote from that to illustrate. She writes in her, uh, her curator's note, the textiles of Timor are beautiful. Many complicated techniques go into making each piece. The colors are lovely and rich. The imagery is intriguing. The more I examine the cloth and learn about the makers and the culture they are part of, the more I love the cloth. But there's not much time to spin yarns if you're fleeing a war zone. Finding out that the people of Timor were being methodically slaughtered by Indonesian troops was shattering. So the show, in effect, is not just about cloth stuck to a wall in a admittedly obscure Toronto museum. It's a mobilizing focus for action. So um, solidarity activists are there. Um, textiles can be read for meaning just as texts are. And many uh, anthropologists have written about this. Uh, textiles are used to express identity. Barbara Hewitt wrote in her first publication on Timorese textiles, which I have some images from here. Um, which focus on uh, women's role, of course, in weaving the Tice cloth. Uh, the weavings on display told stories about Timorese cultural survival and the role of women. The exhibit similarly used Timorese material culture to promote overseas solidarity. So there's echoes of this, of course, in the use of uh, Tice-inspired imagery to represent Timor-Leste today, and stamps uh, in uh, many, many things that are Arte Morris and so on. Um, so but this is being used in Toronto, surprisingly to me, in 1990. So finally, case study. Just as you can read a textile, you can read a demonstration. So solidarity movement structures in North America shift considerably with the arrival. This is very different from Australia or Portugal because there's no Timorese refugees in Canada until the 1990s, after which there are a grand total of three. So it's not a large Timorese community, but um, Nevertheless, those three refugees uh, changed the structures of uh, solidarity movement activism in North America considerably, um, particularly after the 1991 Santa Cruz ma massacre. And they also changed the visual imagery used by solidarity movements, uh, particularly in Canada, which increasingly start to emphasize the spirit of resistance symbolized by the clandestine movement within Timor-Leste itself. Example here. Uh, a demonstration in Ottawa in 1995, which is very consciously echoing the uh, visual style of the 12th November 1991 protest in Dili. So both demonstrations are aiming to fill the streets with Timorese flags and banners in order to deliver a clear message in support of Timorese independence. So the Ottawa demonstration can be read as a text and that's what I try to do here. It delivers a clear message using words sparingly, the visual imagery abundantly. So start with the protest date, 7th of November, 1995, is 20 years, of course, after the Indonesian invasion of Dili. Uh, that means it's going to be a very cold day in Ottawa in December. Um, and perhaps hard to get protesters to brave the weather for a lengthy walk, but the symbolic importance of the date can be used to attract attention from the media and the public. So the protest begins on a stage in front of the Indonesian embassy. And after a uh, consultation with the local police, Timorese refugee activist Bella Gallus, pictured here, delivers a speech. Uh, after that, protesters take to the streets. They walk through the city center of Ottawa to the Canadian Human Rights Memorial, where uh, Manabella speaks once again. This is the Human Rights Memorial in Ottawa. Um, the crowd grows as it moves back onto the streets. And arriving at Parliament Hill, protesters laid down crosses with the names of people killed at the Santa Cruz massacre on the front steps of the Canadian Parliament. And then they turn and face the city with Parliament as the backdrop for their banners. And the Timorese flag is flown by a Timorese woman at the heart of Canada's government who walks the cold pavement alone for a time. So how do we read this demonstration? Well, 
The date indicated that uh, in the resistance slogan, to resist is to win. Uh, its route maps the connection between the Indonesian and Canadian governments uh, with a walk from the Indonesian embassy to the Canadian parliament. Messages on banners underline the point. The lead banner declares uh, East Timor is a Canadian issue. Uh, Stop at the Human Rights Memorial evokes themes of human rights that are central to the Canadian self-image and the self-image of a number of other countries, of course. Uh, the Timorese flags make the march into a block of vibrant red and yellow and black through the streets of the city. And they force onlookers to ask, whose flag is that? So it's an invitation to bystanders to ask questions. Crosses evoke tragedy and Christian overtones while insisting on speaking the names of the dead. And in Parliament, the crowd performs mourning, the laying down of the crosses, and then activism with the display of banners that have been less visible on the streets. And all these banners, by the way, are linking Indonesia and Canada consistently, saying Canada is supporting Indonesia. Here's our message. East Timor is not far away. It is a Canadian issue. And you should care about it, Canadians. So the messaging is consistent and the support is growing in Canada. By 1995, Canadian government officials are saying they have to do something for Timor-Leste, if only to, quote, get ETAN off our backs. And this is from a government document. We have to stop these solidarity activists from bothering us all the time. So we must take some sort of action. It's a sign, and that sort of comment in government documents is a sign that the narrative promoted by solidarity movements is, is making an impact, is eroding the dominant narrative of the Canadian government, which is, this is a hopeless cause, nothing we can do about it, therefore we won't do anything about it. So this is the 1997 APEC summit in Vancouver. This is the only time I'm aware of where the East Timor Alert Network in Canada used an atrocity photo for a mobilizing purpose. The images I've shown are all attempts to show triumph and resistance and positive messages. There's not a heavy use of the other type of human rights imagery, which is focused on let's show the atrocity and try to shock people into action. Much less of that. This is an example where it is. This is um, the APEC summit in Vancouver, an alternative people's summit is held. Jose Ramos Horta is the keynote speaker. Here he's quite good at that. And uh, Bella Gallios there releases photos of torture of Timorese women to the media. The photo of that event is now itself framed by text in the Chega exhibit at CNC. So this is the first major use of atrocity photos by ETAN activists, but the context is important. It comes as the culmination of a Team Timor trip of 10 Timorese activists across Canada and amidst large street protests in Vancouver against the presence of the Indonesian dictator, Sukarto. So just to conclude, uh, solidarity movement activism in Canada grows from small beginnings to becoming a significant protest movement over time. The movement's use of visual imagery constructed an image of the Timorese people in Canada. Whether it's true or not, it's beside the point for my purposes here, they construct an image of how Canadians should see Timor's um, people. Um, first, an image of a tribal peoples representing the best of pre-modern life, lived in harmony with the environment. Later, as a people with a significant and distinct culture of their own as represented through um, uh, textiles. And finally, as a youthful people determined to resist, determined to fight on and to win. These depictions depended on the images that are deployed. The images in turn shaped the way that E10, the East Timor Alert Network of Canada, portrayed the Timorese people, doing so first with very limited knowledge because there are no Timorese in Canada, and then with closer contact into the 1990s. And government records in Canada indicate they were also influential in doing this. Um, the Canadian government finally endorsed Timorese self-determination, which is the solidarity movement's long-standing demand at the end of 1998, so in advance of a number of other Western governments. So I'll leave it there, saying thank you, and admitting that I had a role in, uh, in this as well as a member of ETAN, so I put in a picture of myself at the end. So that's it. Thanks for the uh, chance to share the information. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, David. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I just thought uh, that we could um, have an all-in discussion, um, but obviously with some questions targeted to uh, David and Maria, but also if there were any additional questions to Vicente, um, let's um, have a, a, an all-in discussion as, as well this evening. So, oh, sorry, I keep saying evening because it's pitch black outside. Pitch black where you are. <laughs>
probably, but a different turn of the day, um, turn of the, the, the planet. So um, who would like to start? Um, if anyone has any questions. Um, John, please uh, unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, Vanessa. Uh, David, just a really simple question. I mean, my experience of solidarity meetings and planning demonstrations was we argued black and blue about just about everything. Um, <laughs> Audio's gone. Sorry, John. Hang on. Wait, John. Can you unmute again? We heard black and blue and then please continue. Um, so what you've described is really interesting to me um, in terms of the, the type of presentation that you guys did and, and was this how it, was this, you know, achieved, done consciously and achieved easily or was it a subject of some discussion? That's my question. Thanks, John. Um, David, do you want to um, answer that before we take any more questions? Sure. Um, it was achieved fairly easily. The, uh, the Australian solidarity movement is very fragmented geographically and ideologically and so on, right? And I don't need to tell you this. Um, the Canadian solidarity movement was largely, um, as of the late 1980s, consolidated into one organization, which is ETAN Canada. Um, and the founder of the organization is herself a visual artist. Um, and so the use of those images is broadly accepted. The, uh, um, there's not much dispute about this. That said, local groups do their own thing. So no, the same sorts of arguments did not happen. That, not to say there's no arguments in the solidarity movement in Canada, of course there are, <laughs> but not over this. Okay, hey, more questions from the floor. Haven't had any indications. Can you see me? Can I ask a question? Go ahead, Peter. Well, yeah, well first of all, uh, thanks for your book, David. I enjoyed reading it. It was very interesting to contrast your observations in Canada to the experience that we had over here in Australia. It was very thorough. And uh, one thing regarding visual images, from my own experience going back to 79 to 81 in particular, in particular. I remember the lack of visual images had a massive effect on our ability to get people interested in Seymour. I can re I, there were people who were absolutely outraged about what was happening in South Africa. We'd go to meetings, go to demonstrations. Um, I remember trying to persuade someone who was deeply involved in that campaign that East Timor was just as important and he shrugged his shoulders and thought it was an unimportant issue and you couldn't, we didn't have any evidence anyway. Um, how important is the, the visual, there's something that seems to be about human psychology. Without images, to, uh, you, you can't get the same impact a lot of the time, even though the evidence was actually very strong, but written evidence no matter what sources you cited, didn't have the same impact. Um, and you had, and um, uh, South Africa was on television on a regular basis, so was Zimbabwe. And uh, Timor was ignored. It was not just people on the right that tried to stifle Timor. There are large numbers of people on the left who thought it was an unimportant issue, not in the same category as say campaigning uh, for South Africa or for that matter for things like nuclear disarmament. Would you like to comment on that? Do you think that's a... Uh... Are there any other questions? Um, I might take a, a, a couple while David's thinking about that. Are there any other questions particularly to our other speakers as, as well? Um, can't see everyone all at once so I have to um, just... Maybe a question for both David and Maria, or David or Maria. I was struck in David's paper by the emergence of crosses uh, after Santa Cruz. And there's kind of an element of the evolution of Timorese nationalism in that 
I mean, you wouldn't have seen crosses in the 1970s or possibly 80s. And then you see the church itself, of course, change its orientation over the 80s. Um, and I guess for David or Maria, that question about the, um, the visual image of the cross, I mean, that was very big in Australia by the 90s and the, right at the end, the Catholic Church was obviously a big part of this po popular turn in Australia. And I, I was just struck by that. It doesn't strike me as an image you see in the 70s or even early 80s in relation to uh, Team Marie Solidarity. So question about the symbolism of the cross. When did that start being used? Um, Hannah, you've got a, a question. Yeah, Go ahead. thanks. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit to Peter, actually, which I thought your reflections are really interesting, but just a, a point to come back to David, you mentioned that um, uh, when Bella took the photograph to the um, Apex Summit, and you said this was, you know, this used atrocity photographs and this was something different, you know, this hadn't been part of what the Canadian Solidarity Movement had done before. So I was just wondering uh, why um, this was done, you know, why did, did Bella take these photographs to this event? And then what was the effect of that? You know, how did that differ from the effect of using um, the images of Elaine's images, you know, or these, these solidarity protest images? All right, so over to you, David. Maybe you can start us off and then Maria um, might also chime in as well. Yeah, oh, I can start, um, but I think some of these questions, uh, Peter's question in particular about uh, the power of visual images probably is something that applies to others and most of you who have presented can speak with more authority to that than I can uh, because it's a, it's a broader question about the psychology that visuals have in, uh, um, so I think that's worth coming back to as is the cross for instance, the cross is a very powerful image in some ways, but only it's contextual, right? The cross is not powerful in non-Christian societies um, and not or non-Christian as well as non-post-Christian societies like say Australia. Um, so uh, there are, I mean, I've seen Australian solidarity movement posters with crosses on them in the uh, uh, State Library of uh, uh, Queensland and so on has collections where crosses are used. Um, uh, they're significant. The, uh, I'm thinking of the debates around the Jesus statue in Dili, which again, lots of other people have more interesting thoughts on than I could ever express. Um, so, um, yes, I think visuals are needed to mobilize, absolutely. Um, and I think that the lack of visuals is what forced people to turn to the very sparse record of, um, the very sparse photographic record from before the invasion, and that itself builds an image of, here is a harmonious, environmentally uh, sustainable society that actually serves as a good example for Western societies. And this is what uh, Briere says to the UN Human Rights Commission, for example, is that we're bombing these people and we should actually be learning from them. Um, and because there's not many images available, that gives this type of narrative driven by the photograph some power, I think. Um, yes, you need visuals to mobilize. Um, the cross was an effective one as people are trying to build, particularly in countries where there's not a large Timorese diaspora present, some sort of popular support. You can look to, um, in Canada, they look to the Portuguese community. Catholic imagery helps a lot there. Um, there's a uh, Toronto committee for the liberation of Timor-Leste, working in Portuguese as part of the, uh, the E10 network. Um, so it helps in Catholic circles and the influence of things like the Christian consultation on East Timor um, are very wide. The founding of the East Timor Alert Network of Canada is, is done in response to the Christian consultation on, on East Timor um, call, call to Christians for reflection, which was issued again in the, in the 1980s. Um, so it works. Um, again, I think though it's a, um, a deliberate decision to harness imagery for particular purposes here. Um, why the atrocity photos, Hannah's question. So I tried to lead off and I've had to uh, cut this from the, uh, the full version, but I'm leading off with uh, um, framing from uh, Sonia Delat, who's a, uh, a visual historian um, in, 
in Canada. And uh, she talks about these two types of framing. Um, she talks about the, uh, the way that both have been deployed in humanitarian history. So you go right back to uh, um, refugees from Chinese refugees in Hong Kong building global sympathy for uh, the idea of refugees and helping to transform the photos of suffering Chinese refugees fleeing across the border into Hong Kong build sympathy in uh, settler colonies, colonies of settlement like Australia or Canada for refugees and help to spur the transformation of those from very much colonies of white settlement into uh, countries that are in some ways more welcoming of refugees and migration from Asia. Um, Vanessa, you may differ, but this is uh, uh, Laura Matacoro's argument in her book on uh, the history of Chinese people in, uh, in uh, refugee history. So these photos are available and in some, way, some early years the atrocity photos are perhaps more available. So you've got the famous photos of the 1970s famine um, and Rod Nordland's photos printed around the world um, and you can see uses of those by a number of solidarity groups. That's important, right? Helps put it on the agenda. They're not used in Canada. Um, People prefer to use the Briere photos because they say this doesn't send a message of helpless suffering that we can do nothing about. This, if we use the photos instead, it sends a message about here is a real people who merit international support. The atrocity photos are useful to shock, but they're not useful to build a sense of hope and to mobilize. The images we have from Elaine Briere are useful. The textiles are useful. They build a sense of here is this a sophisticated material culture that can be helped. So they help act, they help spur mobilization, they help spur activism, and that's why they're used. Um, when uh, when Balagalios releases the photos in uh, 1997, it's later, there's a context of a significant solidarity movement in Canada already. Um, the context is of people already protesting, and this is gonna aid the protests by showing another side of what's going on. Um, particularly with Suharto coming to Canada and people trying to stage a citizen's arrest of Suharto, unsuccessfully, of course, getting pepper sprayed for their uh, pains. Um, so there is a, um, a decision to use these. I think it's partly under the influence of the East Timor Human Rights Center uh, in Australia, which has started to put out much more, um, has started to distribute these photos deliberately among solidarity groups and start to use that let's shock people into action, but you need the basis for people already saying there's hope before that will work. So I could say lots more, but I think I've spoken long enough now. So I'm gonna pass it to others. Thank you, David. Uh, Marie, I was just going to ask you if you could maybe comment on the use of the crosses as a motif, um, how you view that. Don't forget to unmute yourself, please. Thank you so much, Dave, for, for your presentation. And um, the, the, there are two issues that I thought was very important. One, of course, is the crosses. And um, of course, the, the visual impact. Um, the, the crosses, it's something that's so embedded in East Timor society that everything we do has to be with crosses because it's that notion of part of our culture, you know, although it's introduced by the Portuguese to East Timor, East Timor is seen as part of our ancestry because although it's seen as a cross, the, the, the Naimaromak, the god from East Timor's culture and the Portuguese culture, uh, it all ends up different roads, but all went to one. And every, from, from perspective here in Perth, every protest we did was similar to what happened in, in Canada. We carry a lot of crosses and it's also a form of prayer. We always feel, I believe we always feel like when we walk, when we talk, when we do protests, God has to be there. And the, the, most Timorese, if, if you do, you do, anything in your life, you don't use, you don't use God or you don't use the cross. You feel there's this notion that there's no point. 
there's no point. So every time we went to a, a protest here, we just felt, okay, God, come with us. And was singing with the cross. And it seemed to have uh, called a lot of attention. And it was always with the mass, was always with the prayer, was always with the cross. And it has affected even in the visual arts. Most, a lot of my work, if you look at it properly, there's always at least one cross in it. <laughs> I'm always, because that is my sign to say, God, you be there. Um, our ancestry, we've got the lulik, the sacred, our animism, but that animism prays to God. So the Timur is always felt very, very, very close to, to the cross. And um, the notion of going anywhere without it, it's, it's, it's um, just saying, you know, there's no point, forget it. Um, and th I think that's why the Timorese were so adamant that even, even you know, after independence, they, they still went to, to, to the Portuguese language as, as an official language because they felt this connection with, with Catholicism that was introduced by the Portuguese. And all our names are in Portuguese. And so the cross naturally came in as well. That's my perception of it, it was mainly a form of prayer and not to be alone. At all times, we're not alone. That's my perception of it. And the visual impact, I agree with, with David, that without it, there wouldn't have been much hope. Because for years and years, we've been telling, I always use this example, for years and years, we've been telling, well, we've been killed. You know, there's a lot of violence committed against our brothers and sisters in team or someone, can you please hear us? Can you please do something? It was a slow process. And then the Santa Cruz massacre happened. And guess what happened? Someone saw it. Someone filmed it and came on TV and everyone saw it was the visual impact. If it wasn't for that film, we'd still be fighting now for independence. That, my, that is my point of view. The, the, the world had to look at it and go, oh my gosh, it is true. Oh, I can see that what they're saying is true. I, 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 yeah, look, look. If that didn't happen, and that's the power of image. And that's why I'm so big on fine arts. <laughs> because I, I think, just look at it this way. A child, when it goes to pre-primary kindy, brings, brings, doesn't bring like a, a math equation to mom and dad or a result of a scientific thing to mom and dad. They bring a drawing. They bring a collage. So it is embedded in our psychic. And you can't really ignore it. And I did when I went to all these protests like Bella Gallius did, we did exactly the same thing, the banners, the flags, the cross. And then one day I just thought, you know, and I thought, why don't I paint this? You know, I can go and scream about, you know, Indonesia out of East Timor, but I can speak a lot more through my painting as opposed to screaming it. And that's why the visual impact is so strong. You know, children are, we are born with it. <laughs> you know, I've, I've got, you know, my boy is four, he's bringing me drawings. <laughs> and it's just, it's just embedded in our psyche. And, and the, years, the years of this visual, the Bella Gallius, the, the, you know, the solidarity groups done around the world, it's all this, you know, it's, it's I mean, I've, I've, I've had panic attacks by looking at some, but I thank God that they are there. And, and the cross, I thank God that it is there. And no matter, if you go to East Timor and you say to them, oh, no, we can go to a cross, but no, no crosses. I can guarantee you 100% no one will turn up if the cross is not there. Because the cross is first and foremost, God first, and then we follow. <laughs> that's, that's the way we think. <laughs> so, um, we, yeah. Thank you, Maria and David. We might have to wrap up shortly because um, it's getting, um, late in the day and I just wanted to um, give um, I think we've got about five minutes left but I just wanted to ask whether our speakers wanted to have some final remarks or if there's any final questions from you that you are burning to ask um, and please I just want to remind everybody that we have a forum for each of our panels so you can go there for our abstracts, our bios, we'll share any links, um, film trailers. Uh, Louisa will put her film there as well for people who want to, to watch that um, later on. So I just don't want to um, 
forget to mention the forum and get you to use the forum to further questions and interactions because I think with a lot of these panels we, we want to see where we can also work together and have lots of synergies with with our work so um, please please use it um, so just any questions from anyone I might take one uh, <laughs> I have another one unless someone else has one yeah Hannah Oh, can I ask? Oh, sorry, I was just going to ask um, Maria, maybe you can just speak a little bit more about what, to come back to some of the themes that uh, Vanessa and, and Marissa set out in the conference panel, I was just wondering if Maria could speak a little bit more about what kind of role she sees her work playing in terms of pushing for social political change and perhaps how that role itself may have may have changed, you know, when uh, earlier paintings that you're doing during the Indonesian occupation compared to now, what role can your work play in terms of demanding um, change, perhaps? Okay. Thank, thanks for that, Emma. Um, well, I think my, my role as a visual artist is to educate and to, to bridge the gap between East Timor and the Western world, um, because I find that we still very traditionalists. And I think that a lot of these Timorese are trying to be very contemporary, are trying to be very modern, but they get, they get lost when, when they, they, they meet, they meet the Western society. And there is a lot of, always a lot of confusion with gender issues, with uh, violence, with um, um, progress, progress, the country progress. And I, I think for the, for the younger generation, my role is to say, you know, if, if, if you really feel strongly about an issue, don't get violent, don't, get, don't start burning, don't start looting, don't start shooting, paint it. It's like, a, it's like, it's like our therapy. And, um, but my main role is the female voice. That's, that's my main concern because that's the forgotten side of East Timor. Um, I feel like, I mean, I've, I've Bella Gallios, after Canada, she came here to Perth. Um, we, we did a lot of stuff together. And um, I think uh, the, the impact of, of, of uh, the, the women, everything that, you know, when they do a protest or they do something that's very, very significant, significant in East Timor's history, you know, they get the women to do the taish and to do the ceramics and to do the, the, the basketry and, you know, to... to, to uh, to, to, to have a, a, a solid and valuable input of East Timorese culture, but um, it stops there. And my role is to say, hang on, we, we are in the, you know, 2020. Um, we, the young people don't want to do basketry. They don't want to go and do Taj. They, they all, they want to go nightclubbing. They, you know, they want to do rap music and they want to be so contemporary and there is no leeway. No one is teaching them uh, cultures <laughs> that we, to, to, in order for us to, to reach the Western society, sometimes we have to speak their language too, you know, not be so traditional. And I think I'm that bridge. The, and that's what I aim for. And I always say the men fought because the women were behind them. <laughs> and, and, you know, now they on the they're going to do 20 years of East Timor's independence. They're talking about the martyrs, the cemetery of the martyrs and the great, uh, you know, the great warriors that fought for East Timor. What about the women? You know, the men went to, the, to, to fight for 20 years in, you know, in, in, the, in the bush. The women had to look after the 20 kids at home. You know, the women are at home being abused because the husband is being very active out there. So it, my role is just to create awareness, to say, please, please look at every angle. The history of East Timor is not one aspect. It's mm -hmm. 10, 20, 30 aspects. And all these aspects make us one. Don't forget us. <laughs> so my role is just to be a voice for the minority, I think. And the more contemporary it is, for me, the better it is because it reaches the wider audience. You know, I could go to Tim and learn how to make Taish. It's great. It's my, my ancestry. But then someone buys a Taish and put it on a table. But if I make a painting and I talk about it and there's more mystery and there's more questions and there's more questions. It's like 
doing a, a beautiful painting of a landscape, you look at it and you say, wow, this is beautiful. What a be oh, beautiful sunset, beautiful colors, but it stops there. But if you, if you do an abstract of a sunset, everyone goes, what's that? But why did you do that? So it, it, the, what, once it's questioned, then you speak. And that's the voice that I have. I do it so they can create a little bit of, can, you know, get the patriarchal society to quieten down a bit because <laughs> I'm, when I go to team, I get in a lot of trouble because they think I'm too outspoken, but they've got no idea how shy I am. So that's why I paint. <laughs> and they ask me questions, I answer. If they don't, I, mean, I, I, I went to do a talk at Curtin University and um, someone said to me, oh, a Timur, there's a Timorese girl, who, a Timorese artist who's doing an exhibition at Pearl Institute of Contemporary Art. We should go and have a look. And I said, yeah, we should. So 20 of us got together and went there. We went there, you know, went through the exhibition, had a coffee, all went home. I never, they needed, didn't know I was the artist. I never told them. And it was great because I got to see their reaction and they're so interested. And that's the power of the visual imagery. Thank you, David. Power. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Mana Maria. I think Thank that's you. a really good point Thanks, to, to end. And um, I think that there's lots of different ways in which women have contributed in various ways to the struggle for a free and independent democracy. Um, some of Hannah and other scholars who work with them reflected some of that as well. And, and it's, a, it's a discussion, but it's only night one of um, our conference. So um, we've got to, um, we've got another two nights and I urge people to come and, and bring these um, ideas and discussions that we've already started in this, um, in this uh, panel to the other streams as well for Tuesday and Wednesday. So there's another couple of nights, so hang in there. And um, if people are interested in doing a bit more collaborative work in terms of the, um, the visual, um, I'd be interested in, in talking to people as well about photography and uh, processed oh, images. Beautiful. Yeah. and looking at iconic images that have done the rounds. Why did certain images become iconic and why did, did others not? What were the, some of the, the ideas of activists that were being conveyed in, in some of these photographs um, in the struggle for um, independence? So interested in, in talking more, so please use the panels and um, uh, the panels, the forum, and please everyone now um, join us for the next session, which is for the book launches and congratulations to all the authors of the books and let's go in thank and, you. you know, find them. So thank you very much to our panel members and to Marisa. Thank you, thank thank you so much, guys. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. See you soon. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for your resilience in staying <laughs> despite the problems. Thank you. <laughs> you can go to bed, David, after this. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.